Venkatesh, Theory Again, as a Banda Murthy. Is that right? Okay. Um, <laughs> don't, don't bastardize it more. But uh, do, do uh, let me tell you something about Venk. Um, so Venkat is an associate professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine and, uh, and the School of Epidemiology and Public Health at the University of Ottawa. He's an emergency physician at the Ottawa Hospital and a scientist with the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. His research interests are emergency department management of syncope and chest pain, and I might add that he's quite an expert in that area. He's a recipient of several peer-reviewed grants from CIHR and NIH, and several excellence awards, including the National New Investigator Award from the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada, and he is co-author in several national international guidelines uh, on and consensus and position papers uh, for syncope. So he's going to tell us about syncope, high and low risk swoons. Thanks, Vic. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you for inviting me um, to the West Coast Conference. And we are going to talk about uh, a person who dies briefly, except they wake up and then come to our emergency department. So um, this is our Twitter handle for our team, Team Bank. Uh, you can just post anything there. I'm just going to do a little poll. Uh, the comparison will be, is my last name difficult or is managing a syncope patient difficult? <laughs> How many people think that my, ma my last name is the difficult thing? Uh, some hands. Managing the syncope patient is the most difficult thing. Oh, a lot of people. We just need to convert you guys to the other group. That's the plan today. Um, I did go for a Medtronic meeting where they played, paid me the flight ticket and gave me some food, so I had to declare. And uh, there is no specific products or devices that we are going to chat about today. Essentially, this is syncope, if you have not seen it before. <laughs> Today, we'll talk about how you can define the condition called syncope so that you can differentiate it from non-syncopal mimickers. We will classify the various reasons why people have syncope, what happens when you discharge patients after they have had a syncopal episode from your emergency department, um, what kind of tests you want to do in the emergency department when you don't know what is happening with the patient, how we can risk stratify these patients. And evidence-based management, we're putting all of this together as to how you can deal with your patients. A little word about presyncope and driving. Okay, uh, how many of you have not seen a case like this? An adult emergency department who are working in an adult emergency department, 80-year-old male, was found on the floor by the daughter. The daughter lives nearby. They, she went in this morning to check on the patient. She found him on the floor. How many people have not seen a patient like this? Excellent. Every single day, like similar to Ron Goldman, they come to me. Always older patients, they had some type of a thing of some sort. So the, the differential diagnosis is really broad. It can be a, a lots of things. Let's go through this properly. If you have a sudden onset of loss of consciousness that was transient, followed by spontaneous complete recovery, then you are dealing with syncope. In other words, we need three important characteristics. When you see the patient, the mental status should be back to normal. There should have been a loss of consciousness, and the loss of consciousness must be sudden in onset, transient, and there should have been a spontaneous complete recovery. Let's go through the differential diagnosis for syncope now. If the patient is not back to baseline, you may be dealing with delirium, coma, postictal phase, and intracranial events such as TIA, CVA, or an intracranial pathology such as tumors, or metabolic conditions such as hypoglycemia, hypoxemia, or intoxicated individuals either with uh, marijuana or alcohol or whatever it may be. I get asked uh, the question all the time. How do you differentiate seizures from syncope? 
in seizures, there will be tonic-clonic movements of the arms and the legs. There will be some frothing of the mouth. There may be some bite marks in the tongue. There will be some incontinence. More importantly, at the post-ictal phase, is usually very prolonged, lasting like 15, 30 minutes, even hours. During syncope, you might get these little jerky movements called anoxic seizures. People usually confuse them with seizures and then tell you, yeah, he had a seizure episode, he had a seizure episode. Take the history properly, go through the steps slowly so that you just delineate these mi minimal movements of the arms and the legs and don't confuse it with seizures. These are anoxic seizures that happen in syncope. These patients have had syncope. There is a lot of literature out there which says that these patients have been put on anticonvulsants only to find somebody else later found an arrhythmia years later. Okay, let's go to the second one. If there is no loss of consciousness, you may be dealing with presyncope, false psychogenic pseudosyncope, or a carotid TIA. If you have all three of them, then you are probably dealing with syncope. There's only one condition that is closely mimics syncope is if you have a vertebral bacilli or TIA. That's because of reduced blood supply to the brainstem. Your ascending reticular activating system did not have enough blood supply. You can have a loss of consciousness. But usually, these patients will have posterior circulation symptoms in the form of aphasia, dysarthria, ataxia, or dysphagia, those type of things. And their symptoms usually last for a longer period of time, not less than five minutes. Syncope patients usually come back within less than five minutes, they are totally back to normal. So now you know how to diagnose the symptom syncope and all the syncope mimickers, you can be ruled out. All the evidence from now on that we are going to talk about is only about syncope. Classification of syncope. So the essence of syncope is that there is a transient reduction in the blood supply to the brain, and it is a global hypoperfusion of the brain. There are three main types that the cardiologists talk about, vasovagal syncope, orthostatic hypotension, and a cardiac syncope. A very busy slide, but we'll just break it down. What type of syncope is this? Vasovagal. So what happens during vasovagal? You have some kind of fear, emotion, or pain. That stimulates our sympathetic nervous system. Your heartbeat goes fast. Your, um, uh, your, um, your blood pressure goes higher. This sympathetic stimulation is suddenly withdrawn, and the parasympathetic overstimulation comes in, leading on to vasodilation and bradycardia. That leads to syncope. Or you can have a primary parasympathetic event, such as like a nauseated feeling, micturition syncope, cough syncope, direct parasympathetic overstimulation, leading on to bradycardia, vasodilation, and then you lose your consciousness. Once you're down, your venous return kicks in, and things settle down, and you're back to normal. Okay? That's vasovagal syncope. This is what type of syncope until proven otherwise? Cardiac. This is cardiac until proven otherwise. In any patient, exertional, sudden and onset drops down. This is cardiac until proven otherwise. So what happens in cardiac? You could have an arrhythmia. Either you are too fast, there is not enough time to fill up your ventricles with enough blood, or you're too slow so that your cardiac output is stroke volume excess times heart rate, you're too slow, there's not enough cardiac output to have your circulation to your brain, or there is something restrictive outside, such as a large pericardial effusion, you do an exertion, the cardiac output is not enough, or you have a tight aortic stenosis, once again, the cardiac output is not enough when you're exerting. These are things, cardiac conditions that can cause you reduced blood supply to the brain transiently, causing you syncope. PE is another thing where there is a large clot. As it passes through the pulmonary vasculature, it can cause both a vagal response and as well as a transient, reduced left-sided cardiac output, leading on to syncope. 
The last condition, classification, is orthostatic hypertension. Every single time, every single day, we stand up so many times. There is pulling of blood downstairs in our feet. There is reduced cardiac venous return. There is reduced cardiac output. And there is reduced blood flow to the carotids. And that is immediately sensed by our carotid receptors, which in turn stimulates the autonomic nervous system, causing our heart rate to go up, our vascular resistance to go up, to reestablish appropriate blood supply to the brain. That is a normal response. This response can be blunted if you have, if you are on calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, or vasodilators. Or if you have an autonomic nervous system problem, such as diabetic neuropathy or Parkinson's disease. Or you could have a normal response. Your tank is completely dry. You are completely dehydrated. Still, the normal response is not enough for you to have establishment of a normal blood flow to the brain. So these are the conditions that is caused by orthostatic hypertension leading on to syncope. From, so why is this important? This is one of the papers that is published by one of my residents from the studies that we are doing. If you make a diagnosis at the end of the emergency visit before discharging them home, if you made a diagnosis of vasovagal syncope, then you have a less than 1% chance of anything bad happening. If you have orthostatic hypertension or if you're unknown, it's about 4 to 5%. And if you made a diagnosis of cardiac syncope, you have almost 21% of something bad happening. So this is important. It helps us to prognosticate at the end of our emergency visit. A few things that are important to know with respect to these types. The type NYD, or I don't know the reason for syncope, is there for emergency physicians because Every time, even me, when I just do this and then send it to the cardiologist, they send back to me saying that it's a vasovagal syncope. For them, everything is vasovagal syncope. And as emergency physicians, we need to look for serious underlying conditions that might have caused the syncope because we will be most of the times the first person in contact after the syncope. And of all of our patients, two-thirds of our patients will arrive by ambulances because of the feeling that they thought that somebody was dead there. So that's why they call an ambulance. And vasovagal syncope can be because of pain, and that pain may be because of a serious underlying condition. Subarachnoid hemorrhage, thoracic aortic dissection, ectopic pregnancy. The amount of blood is never large enough to cause severe hypotension but it was the pain that caused the syncope. But for us, it's an important thing to diagnose, not to miss. Though it is truly, for the cardiologist, it is a vasovagal syncope. With respect to the time of onset for orthostatic hypotension, there are three different types. One is the immediate orthostatic hypotension. This will be your young patient in the teens or like you know, in uh, upper 20s who presents with the POT syndrome, which is the postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. They stand up, they become tachycardic, they become orthostatic, hypotension, and then they lose out. They, they, they lose their consciousness. It's fairly easy, very difficult to treat. They have to stand up really, really slow. They have to keep their tank full. The classical orthostatic hypotension is what we talk about when you stand up after three minutes passing out. But remember, among elderly patients, there is something called as a delayed orthostatic hypertension. It can take up to 30 minutes or 45 minutes. If you get a history of an elderly patient, every single day, after 30 minutes or in one hour, there is a fall in the nursing home or a retirement home, then grandma may have a delayed orthostatic hypertension. Be careful with the history. So we know to diagnose syncope. We know to, die, to put, classify them, the cause of syncope. Now, let's look at what are the serious underlying conditions as emergency physicians we must identify. We we'll like to make sure that there is nothing going on in the brain, such as an intracranial um, bleeding, so like subarachnoid hemorrhage. Sometimes tumors can have a vagal response, and they can lead on to syncope. So just be careful. A person who has got sudden severe headache or an ongoing headache, think about something intracranial that's going on. Intrathoracic, think about MIs, think about PEs, and think about something restrictive, including a severe aortic stenosis. Intraabdominal, think about bleeding, triple A, or an ectopic pregnancy. And also globally, think about somebody who's looking unwell, hypotensive. Is there a sepsis that's brewing? The second set of things you're going to think about are arrhythmias, bradyarrhythmias, tachyarrhythmias that are either atrial or ventricular. 
I want you to think about the serious underlying conditions on two aspects. One is something that you need to detect that's already going on in the patient. That's the ones in the top ones there, which are the non-arrhythmias, are the ones you're going to have to detect them by proper evaluation. The arrhythmias are very difficult because they had a transient arrhythmia, they are back to baseline now on their ECG. It's a little difficult to detect, but we have a solution for it. So detection versus prediction, think about that. So what do the studies show? These are some old studies, just to highlight the point. And these are the outcomes of patients after the syncope within 30 days. Less than 1% die. About 5 to 7% of them will have arrhythmias. 3% to 4% will be telling very clearly what type of arrhythmia they have because they present with that arrhythmia. And 3% will have it occult, 2 to 3%, they are because their, base, their ECG is now back to baseline. PE is less than 1%. Overall, 10% of your patients with syncope have something serious underlying. 5 to 6%, you can, they are very clear, or by proper evaluation, you can detect them. And about 3 to 4% are very occult, and usually are missed in the emergency department. So you diagnose syncope, you classify them, you look for serious underlying conditions, Next, what are we going to do in the form of evaluation in the eMERGE? Blood tests. The yield is about 2 to 3%. Just do it only when you suspect bleeding or if you think that there are a huge amount of electrolyte abnormalities causing arrhythmias. Do not regularly do calcium, magnesium, and phosphate until otherwise it's clearly indicated. Severe malnourished patient, very sick patient, or there is a reason to do it, such as like uh, oncological malignancies or any complications related with that. Cardiac biomarkers, troponin. Troponin is part of several risk stratification strategies, but you don't have to do it on every patient. An young patient who does not have cardiac problems has got a normal ECG, and there is no reason that you think that this is something serious going on. You do not need to do a troponin on the patient. If you need to use the scores, just assume that the troponin is normal. ECG. You might consider doing ECG at least once in a patient who comes repeatedly or in every patient. So if the patient has already had several recurrent syncopies and then has had documented normal ECG, no need to do that. If it is a first time presentation in a young patient, because ECG will help us to diagnose the Brugada syndromes, the arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasias, and uh, hokum and these type of things. If they've never had an ECG, consider doing an ECG. One another thing is that, that Brugada syndromes can become more prominent after their syncope. Their regular ECGs could be normal, but now immediately around the perisyncopal period, they could have a better identification of Brugada syndrome on ECG. So consider doing an ECG on more patients. For PE and CT head, we'll just talk about it. How many of you have heard about the PESID trial? Yeah, so they said that they identified pulmonary embolism in one in six patients that were hospitalized for the first episode of syncope. This is an Italian study, and it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Sorry, New England Journal of Medicine. So the prevalence of PE in their cohort was 17.3%, and 12.7% of patients who had a non-PE serious condition also had a PE. One fourth of conditions where you did not know the cause of syncope in the emergency department or during admission had an underlying PE. They suggested that we should probably be investigating all patients for syncope, but there were huge methodological flaws. They admitted patients, this was a thrombosis group which admitted syncope patients under their unit, and no wonder they found more PEs. So going back to the slide where there were a lot of studies that were done, Previously, all the studies have shown that the prevalence of PE was less than 1% within 30 days in all the previous studies that were done. So this was kind of a shock to many people when they said that they had PE, one in six of all patients. So we pooled the data. Uh, we had a large data set, and as well as the US, uh, my, our counterparts in the US had a large data set. So we pooled about 9,000 patient data to evaluate this prevalence of PE among patients with syncope and the prevalence was 0.6% in the pool data. 0.5% was identified in eMERGE, and 0.1% was hospitalized, among hospitalized patients were identified. 
and 0.1% of patients we discharged home and they came back with a PE. And then about another 0.1% had a PE and a non-PE condition. So the prevalence of PE among all comers to ED with syncope is very low. And the prevalence among those who are hospitalized or who have a non-PE condition is really low. So be really careful about investigating everybody for PE. Investigate only when you are suspicious for PE. CD head for patients with syncope. This is one of the um, posters, uh, one of the studies, systematic reviews that was done one of, by one of my medical students. So in this systematic review, there were 17 studies that were included. 50% of all patients with syncope got a, a CT of the head, of which 1.6% were positive. If you take the emergency department studies alone, once again, 55% of all patients who presented the syncope had a CT, and the yield was about 4%. The yield is low. Be really careful in indiscriminate use of CT. Yield of blood test and CT of the head is low. Prevalence of PE is low. Choose your investigations wisely for syncope. So after your evaluation, you don't know what is going on. What should we do? So we have a lot of help. We have been very active. There's a lot of scoring systems to just confuse you guys. Uh, to make it worse, and I developed the last one. So, but don't worry, there are some common themes. Older age is bad. If you have heart disease, that's bad. If you have an abnormal ECG, that's bad. If you have history that's more suggestive of a cardiovascular syncope, then it's bad. If you have a history that suggests more vasovagal syncope, that's good. If you have abnormal vital signs, that's really bad. So we developed the Canadian syncope risk score. There are like nine predictors in there. You give a score for each of the predictors, and the total score tells you what the risk is. For example, if you are very low risk, there is less than 1% chance of anything bad happening. If you are low risk, 1% to 2%, medium risk goes up higher like that. So this is the derivation phase where we enrolled about 4,000 plus patients across Canada. After that, we did the validation phase by enrolling another 3,000 plus patients. So we have a total of about 7,200 patients across Canada, uh, five provinces, 11 emergency departments across Canada. So this is our final results that I presented as a plenary in SAEM and in CAPE last year. So if you're very low, Risk, the risk of any serious outcome is 0.3, and if you're low, it's 1.1%. That increases as you go up the risk category. Your chance of dying within 30 days is 0% if you're low or very low risk, and just goes up. If your chance of arrhythmia is 0.2 or 0.2%, if you're in the low risk categories, goes up, and the chance of ventricular arrhythmia is 0%. So you just see death is 0%, ventricular arrhythmia is 0% if you're low risk. And your chance of non-arrhythmia is less than 1%. So how can you use this? You do your evaluation and then use the Canadian syncope risk score. And then if your patient is low risk, they have a very, very low risk of death very low risk of, almost zero nil risk of ventricular arrhythmia, less than 1% risk of anything bad happening. You can discharge them home right away. If you're medium risk, you have 3% chance of arrhythmias, but almost majority of them are atrial arrhythmias. Ventricular arrhythmias are very rare. And there is a small percentage of non-arrhythmic conditions, which is the serious conditions that we have to detect them, that do happen after discharge from the emergency department. So you can do a shared decision-making model, wherein like you just if they are reasonable, if they have adequate support at home, just say, these are the things to look for. If you have a severe headache, if you have shortness of breath, if, if you have something going on in the belly, and if you obviously see blood that's coming out of your mouth of your, or your back passage, just come back. Or if you're feeling unwell, come back. You may be having some of these things that are developing. Okay? For these arrhythmias, you can just put them on a monitor and then send them home. For the high risk, you can consider admission. And with respect to the number of days of admission, I'll just talk to you in a little bit. 
how long do you want to keep them in the emergency department? This is a Kaplan-Meier curve, and the blue one is the low-risk patients. The red ones are the medium risk, and the green ones are the high-risk patients. This is 30 days, 722, 720 hours, and this is the proportion of patients with the serious outcomes. So everybody starts at 100%, and if you have a serious outcome, you go down. The number of people who are event-free, or what we call a survival estimate, is about 90% among medium-risk patients, and among high-risk patients, it's about 35% of them will have something bad happening. If you look at it, majority of things are happening right at the beginning. Let's zoom in the 24 hours. Low-risk patients, nothing happens all the way through, even in the previous slide, all the way within 30 days. You can discharge them right away after your initial evaluation. They probably do not need any blood tests. They do not need to be monitored in eMERGE. They do not need any tests outside. Just discharge them home. Sorry, if I press something. Thank you. For medium and high risk patients, six hours. But they are at risk for arrhythmias after you discharge them. So we recommend that you put them on some kind of a monitoring device. And if you just look at it, these are the proportion of patients who are having arrhythmias. The red bars are for high risk patients, and the blue bars are for moderate risk patients, and it is zero to 30 days. And things happen in, right at the beginning, all the way until 15 days. So we don't know how long they need to be monitored, but probably about 15 days at the current time is what to begin with. We are doing a randomized control trial to just give you some more answers. How long do the high risk patients need to be admitted? Probably about three to four days but still the risk is low. It's about like one to 2%, okay? So, low risk patients can be discharged home immediately. Medium risk patients, after you discuss with them, can be discharged home. Um, you can think of putting a monitor on these patients. High risk patients can be considered for admission, um, but if you discharge them home, you should probably put a monitoring device on them. So, to put it in a nutshell, you know how to diagnose skin syncope? You know the types of syncope. You know that you have to choose your investigations widely, wisely. Risk stratification and how to manage the high risk and the low risk patients. And obviously, if you have an evolving non-arrhythmia such as sepsis, or if you have, if you are high risk for ventricular arrhythmia, they need to be admitted. Medium and high risk patients will benefit from monitoring. And if you apply them earlier, your diagnostic yield is good. Pre-syncope is exactly like syncope, but your outcome rate is a little lower. It's when you have all the prodromal symptoms and you don't lose your consciousness. Coming to driving, just look at the CMA book, and if you have single episode vasovagal syncope, no restriction, situational syncope, or single episode of unexplained syncope, or recurrent vasovagal syncope, wait for one week if it is private driving, and this is for commercial driving, and if it's recurrent unexplained syncope, wait for three months. And by the way, this, we have confirmed that we cannot take off these restrictions based upon a systematic review that we did recently. And I will stop there. <laughs>